Who is Jesus Christ? It's the most important question that's been asked for the last 2,000 years. And it has the most important answer. Who is Jesus? Every year at Christmas and Easter, you see U.S. News and Newsweek and Time Magazine and all other publications try to answer this question. They're on the search for the historical Jesus. They're on the search for the Jesus that actually was. They're looking to find out if the Jesus of the Bible is fictional, if the Jesus of the Bible is spiritual, but they're asking the age-old question, is he God? Is he divine? I want to write a letter to the editors of these magazines and tell them, stop publishing these issues because the question has already been answered in the Gospel of John. It's already been done. 2,000 years ago, this question was asked and answered, so there's no need to put out these religious issues every Christmas and Easter. John tells us himself at the end of the gospel that he's writing this book. Why? That we might know that Jesus is the Christ. And that in believing in him have eternal life. Life in his name. That's who he is and why he's come. So the question has already been asked and answered. I get the feeling that my letter to Newsweek would probably not have any effect. Because despite the clear evidence of the Bible, the question keeps getting asked. People keep holding on to different ideas of who Jesus is. It's true in our day, and it was true in John's day as well. John chapter 7. John chapter 7 reads like a case of mistaken identity. John chapter 7 reads with confusion and with division over who Jesus is, everyone in this passage is trying to figure out who is Jesus. Is he a lawbreaker? Is he a magician? Is he a scribe? Is he a crazy man? Is he deluded? Is he a political problem? Or is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? If you judge Christ, if you judge Jesus incorrectly, it's the costliest mistake you can make. So we're going to look at this question being asked three different ways in, in this chapter. Who do they say he is? Who does he say he is? And who do you say he is? Who do they say he is? Who does he say he is? Who do you say he is? That's John chapter 7. Let's stand and let's read the passage together. If you're not able to stand, that's okay. You can sit. It's a long chapter. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews' feast of booths was at hand. So his brother said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. For not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, My time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. After saying this, he remained in Galilee. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he is a good man, others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Verse 14, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning? When he has never studied. So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? 
The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel at it. Moses gave you circumcision, not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers, and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the, on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Key verse here. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Verse 25. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come from my own, of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him. But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer, and then I am going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean by saying, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? And comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. 45. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. Our old friend Nicodemus in verse 50. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Let's pray. God, confusion abounds in this passage. But we believe that your word wants to communicate to us who is Jesus. And so help us to see through the confusion. Help us to see and believe who Jesus really is today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can find your seats. We're not going to be able to dip into every single verse and fine detail of this chapter, but we're going to use these questions to lay over chapter 7 as a grid. Who do they say he is? Who does he say he is? And who do you say that he is? So first is who do they say he is? The they in this chapter is three different groups. It's his brothers. It's the crowd of people where he teaches. And it's the religious leadership. So who do they say he is? First, who do the brothers say that Jesus is? This passage picks up about six months after the feeding of the 5,000. And you can tell by just the little that it's talked about here, there's not a whole lot recorded. It says, after this, he went about in Galilee. He would not go into Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So he's, he's staying around the same area. He's not wanting to move. He knows that there's a plot out to kill him. And so he's 
staying around, kind of laying low, keeping a low profile in the Galilean countryside. And we see this event that takes place that might call him out of hiding, so to speak. It's the Jews' feast of the booths. The Jews' feast of the booths, otherwise known as the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the greatest celebrations in all of the Jewish um, feasts and festivals. It was a huge week-long party. You can read about it in Leviticus 23, 42, and 43. And it was a celebration of God's faithfulness and his provision to Israel during the wilderness wanderings. So what they would do during this feast is they would set up these booths. They would set up these makeshift houses and they would live in these houses to symbolize what it was like to live in the wilderness and how God was faithful to them day in and day out. For seven days of festivities, singing together in the streets, they would declare with one voice, there is one true God and to him we give thanks. He's the one who satisfies. He's the one who sustains them. They do this every year. It's a much looked forward to event. On the eighth day of the Feast of Booze was this huge, huge celebration. The last day was always the best day. It was to conclude the whole affair. It was laden with symbolism of lights and water pouring, and it was this great time of, of festivity, of giving thanks to God. It was so popular that it was just called the feast. They all knew what it was. It was the feast. And after Jesus feeds the 5,000, and after he says, eat my flesh and drink my blood, and they say, this is a hard saying. Who can accept this? And many, many turn away. To the brothers, this seems like a great opportunity for Jesus to get back on his game. They want him to go up to the feast and get the following that he deserves. It says in verse 3, So the brothers said, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you're doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. The brothers want him treated like a rock star. They want him to go up to the feast. They want him to work his magic. They want everyone to believe in him. They want him to go big time on the big stage of Jerusalem. That's what the brothers want. Now, bear in mind, this is Jesus' brothers. If you have younger brothers, you can kind of understand the sentiment. They want their older brother to receive attention, and they want to be right there along with him when he goes. They want Jesus to prove himself, and they want him to get the respect that he deserves. And here's what's in their mind. Here's what they're thinking. Jesus goes to Jerusalem. Jesus does his crazy feeding 5,000 people thing. And on the basis of his power alone, everyone will be amazed. They want him to go and show his works openly. They want the following that's left. The 5,000 has faded away. They want the following that should have been his but they misjudge who Jesus is. And they misjudge why Jesus has come. It says in verse 5, for not even his brothers believe in him. That's to explain why they're asking Jesus to do this. They're asking him to do this because they don't believe in him, truly. They've misunderstood the signs. They don't believe in him as the Messiah. They don't believe in his position as the Lord of all. They think that Jesus' power will cause people to believe. But we know that's not true because they don't believe. His power has not caused them to believe. We're tempted by the same thing at times. We think, if God would show his power to us, if God would give me the job that I've been praying for, if God would give me the bonus that I, I desperately need, if God will do this or do that, and we make these deals with God, then we'll know his power, and then we'll believe. We do that at times ourselves. We turn God into this cosmic vending machine where if he does this for us, it will show us that he's great. And Jesus knows better than that. He knows their motive, he knows their hearts, and he knows the problem that they've misjudged him. They've misjudged him as a parlor act. They've misjudged him as a magician. They want him to work his magic. Jesus doesn't like that. Verse 6, he says, My time has not yet come. Your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast. 
for my time has not yet fully come. It's ironic that they ask him to go up to the feast to show himself to the world, thinking that that's what Jesus deserves. And he says, if I go to do that, I'm telling the world that they're evil. It's not going to be a good scene if Jesus goes up to Jerusalem. It's good, to be, it's good to be reminded that Jesus is not looking to win a popularity contest. He's not looking to become as famous as he could possibly be. He's looking to fulfill his mission. The time has not yet come, and his brothers don't see. They don't have eyes to see. They misunderstand his identity. Second question, who, does the, who do they think he is? Who does the crowd think he is? Who does the brother, the crowd, the leaders... Who does the crowd think he is? And this takes up the bulk of the passage. Verse 10, But after the brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. See, he wasn't going to avoid the feast. He just wasn't going to go on their terms. He was going to go on the Father's terms. He goes when the Father tells him. Verse 14, About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Think about this. We don't, we don't have on record what Jesus taught, but we can see the clear effects from his teaching when he goes up to the feast and he stands up and proclaims his voice. People listen to this man. He has authority. We've seen his authority in John 2. We've seen his authority all throughout the gospel. What they're hearing is power. What they're hearing is truth. What they're hearing is authority. Imagine if Jesus was the speaker for tonight. Let Chris sit down. Let's listen to Jesus talk. Let's listen to the word of life, the word of truth address us. Wouldn't that be awesome? Wouldn't that be an amazing conversation to have recorded? Wouldn't you, if you were sitting there listening to Jesus, the word became flesh? Wouldn't you, if you were listening to him preach and explain the scriptures, wouldn't you marvel? The text says that they marveled in verse 15. But that's not why they're marveling. They're not marveling because Jesus is the word of life. They're marveling because as he speaks and as he's teaching with authority, they marvel because this man has never studied. This man does not appear to have the qualifications necessary to do what he's doing. They're marveling that he's unqualified. They're not marveling that he's Jesus. They're not concerned about the truthfulness of his message. Who gives him the ability and the credentials to speak? That's what they're marveling at. Look at verse 16. Jesus answers them, My teaching is not mine but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. So what's he saying? He's saying, you want my credentials? I come from God. I speak on the authority of God. Now understand, in this culture, originality was not considered a good thing. They're not looking for someone to make a creative speech. Most of the scribes who taught in the temple would speak for a little bit, and then they would recite a list of sources as to their authority. So they would speak, and they would source, and they would speak, and they would source, and they would speak, and they would source. Jesus just gets up, and he speaks. You know why? Because he is the source. God is the source. He claims his own authority derived from his relationship with God. And he says to them, you know what? If you're interested in, in, in knowing the will of God truly, you don't need to look to the footnotes. You don't need to look to the other sources. The one who sent me is true. In other words, he says, my truth is self-authenticating. I don't need promotional materials. I don't need marketing. It's true because I say it's true. Jesus is the truth. If you really want to follow the truth of God, he's saying, believe in me. Which I think is insulting at best to these people. It's insulting at best. Because here they are, and imagine this. 
here they are in makeshift houses, celebrating the Feast of Booths, which is a declaration of the greatness and faithfulness and truth of God. And truth comes into their midst, and they reject him. And he says, if you reject me, you're rejecting all that you're doing. He challenges their sincerity of worshiping God. If they want to worship God, they would worship him. He doesn't stop there. He says more in verse 19. Has not Moses given you the law? Ooh, now he's going after a touchy point. <laughs> Has not Moses given you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. So why do you seek to kill me? Saying, hypocrites, none of you keep the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Well, who's trying to kill Jesus? They say, you have a demon. You must be mad. Why would anyone want to kill you? 21, he says, I did one work, and you all marvel at it. Do you remember what the one work was? John 5, the healing of the invalid on the Sabbath. Remember from John 5, the leaders, they didn't care about the miracle. They didn't care about the man. They cared about the breaking of the law. And from that point on, remember I said John 5, John 5 is the beginning of the end of Jesus' ministry. From that point on, the Jews seek to kill him. Moses gave you circumcision, verse 22. Not that it's Moses, but from the fathers, just like the bread of life that came down from from heaven, the bread that came down, the manna that came down. That wasn't from Moses. That was from the Father, John 6. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on a Sabbath, listen, a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances but with right judgment. So he's referencing chapter 5. He's referencing this miracle, and he doesn't defend himself by his actions, but what he does is he appeals to an already established principle in keeping the law. He kind of puts it back on them. He says, Jews, you're under the law, and yet you also break the law. Well, how do you handle this when situations arise for you? What happens if a child is born on the Sabbath? What would they do? What would happen if a child was born on the Sabbath? requirements were for the child to be circumcised on the eighth day, which would have been in the Jewish week, the following Sabbath. Wait a minute. You can't do that on the Sabbath because all work was prohibited on the Sabbath. So which law are you going to uphold? You've got to break one law to uphold the other law. Either way you choose, you're a lawbreaker. And yet it was a known common practice for them to go ahead with circumcision. They kept the law in that regard, even if it was on the Sabbath. So Jesus is appealing to this same way of thinking. He's saying, if you do this one thing to the body to make it well, the, the, the circumcision was the right of, of entrance into the community. If you do this one thing to make the body well, how can you get mad at me for making a whole man well? You see, he's basically saying, you can't put your logic on me. I put it back on you. <laughs> As you can imagine, this caused quite the stir and quite the debate. And here was the question that everybody asked. Who is Jesus? Who is this guy? Verse 25, is not this the man whom they seek to kill? And yet he's speaking openly and they're saying nothing to him. So maybe he is the Christ. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows who Jesus is. He's not an educated. He's not a lawbreaker. Maybe he's the Christ. If no one's doing anything about this, maybe he is the Christ. Jesus calls them and he calls us to judge rightly. He says, don't judge by appearances. Judge with right judgments. Do they judge him rightly? Do the crowds get who Jesus is? No. Verse 26 and 27. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But, meaning a definite conclusion is being drawn, we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. And so they write him off. So no, they don't judge him rightly. Even with the word of life himself 
teaching them, they don't believe. They misjudge. Jesus doesn't meet their expectations. He doesn't meet their qualifications. They couldn't believe that a carpenter from Nazareth, from Nazareth could be the long-awaited Messiah no matter how many times he told them, no matter how much evidence was before their eyes. So you've got the brothers who think he's the magician Messiah. You've got the crowds who think he's an unqualified Messiah. But who do the leaders say that Jesus is? Who do the leaders say he is? Verse 32. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Okay, so we know where they stand. They don't even give him a chance. They just, they hear about Jesus, and they, they think he's a threat to their power, and they send someone to arrest Jesus. He is, at best, a dangerous Messiah to the leadership. They've already made up their minds from John 5 that Jesus was a lawbreaker and a revolutionary and someone who needed to be silenced. And so they send out their officers to arrest him and bring him in. Now, I want us to skip down to verse 45 because it picks up this conversation with the Pharisees in verse 45. They send the officers away, and then in verse 45, they come back. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, why did you not bring him in? So they don't get Jesus. They don't arrest him. And the answer, no one has ever spoke like this man. So the, the ones that they send to go get him, they're like, I, we don't know who he is, and we're not going to touch him. We're not going to do anything. The Pharisees answered them, have you also been deceived? See, in their minds, you either arrest him or you're deceived. There's no other option. 49, but this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and remember we saw Nicodemus, his interaction with Jesus, he was confused on who he was. And now you see Nicodemus playing a role of mediation and a role of support. He says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? Remember, this is Nicodemus, the one that's respected. They reply, are you from Galilee too? I mean, you'd half expect them to say, with like that mocking voice, does our law require you to judge? And like talking back to him and just mocking him. Are you from Galilee too? Because you can't possibly believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Unless you're deceived. They misjudge Jesus. They miss the significance of who he is. So three groups. The brothers, they think he's a magician. The crowds, they think he's unqualified. The leaders, they think that he's dangerous. No answers come from this entire time. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth dialogue. The question still remains, who is Jesus? And we should probably look to see who he says he is. Who does Jesus say he is? Don't, don't, don't you think that we should look and see who he tells us that he is? Let's do that. Let's find out who Jesus is. And we find out on the last day of the feast, the great day. Remember, all throughout the week, running in the background of these conversations, running in the background of his teaching, running in the background of all the different confusion and who is he, and maybe he is the Christ, and maybe he's not the Christ, is this wonderful reminder of God's faithfulness and promised renewal for the people of God. So they're celebrating the feast this whole time. All week long, the Jews are recommitting themselves to gratefulness and to joy in God. And they get to the last day, the most special day of all, and this is what would have taken place, according to D.A. Carson. He writes, A golden flagon was filled with water from the pool of Siloam and was carried in a procession led by the high priest back to the temple. As the procession approached the water gate on the south side of the inner court, three blasts from the Sopar... A trumpet connected with joyful occasions were sounded. While the pilgrims watched, the priest processed around the altar with the flagon, with the temple choir singing the Hallel from Psalm 113 to 118. When the choir reached Psalm 118, every male pilgrim shook a lulav, which was a willow and myrtle twig tied with a palm in his right hand, 
while in his left raised a piece of citrus fruit, which was a sign of the ingathered harvest. And all cried, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, give thanks to the Lord, three times. The water was offered to God at the time of the morning sacrifice, along with the daily drink offering of wine. The wine and water were poured into their respective silver bowls and then poured out before the Lord. It's against this backdrop. It's against the, this great scene of water pouring and gratefulness and their hope for the future Messiah that Jesus makes his way up to a visible spot on the great day, stands up, and he cries out to the massive crowd that's gathered. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So maybe even at the time when the water is being poured, Jesus is directing their attention away from the ceremony and to himself. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. Can you picture the scene? Jesus up. The ceremony taking place. He's crying out and he's saying, if you're thirsty, look this way. Look to me. Out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Who is Jesus? Jesus is the feast. Jesus is the feast of booths. Jesus is the one whom they are celebrating in the celebration of the feast of booths. Jesus is the one who has given them provision. Jesus is the one who satisfies and sustains. Jesus is the one who is faithful until the end. Everything that the feast was was designed to point to Jesus. And so when he stands up and he proclaims, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me. He's saying, I am the feast. Look no further than to look to me and you'll always be satisfied. He's in their midst. It's amazing. They've celebrated this year after year after year. But on this year, the real feast was present. Carson writes again, The water pouring ceremony is interpreted in these traditions as a foretaste of the eschatological rivers of living water foreseen by Ezekiel 47 and Zechariah 13. He's saying the promise of Ezekiel, the promise of Zechariah, it's fulfilled in me. The source of living water, the life giver, the thirst quencher, the one that the Old Testament points to, no matter what the brothers think, no matter what the crowds think, no matter what the leadership thinks, he is the Christ. And that is the point. Who is Jesus? He is the Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the feast. Most of them miss it. Most of them don't have eyes to see. Here's the problem. Anybody can say what Jesus said. Anybody can get up on top of a high place and proclaim with a loud voice what Jesus proclaims. Proclaiming himself as the feast does not make him the Messiah. And so John, the author of the gospel, adds his own narration in verse 39, to fill out the picture, he says, Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So John is writing this from the other side of the cross. He knows what Jesus means when he says his hour has not yet come. He knows what Jesus means when he says his hour has not yet arrived because he knows that Jesus will be crucified on the wooden cross for the sins of the world. That's the hour that's coming because it's already happened when John writes. John writes 
after the cross. He writes after the giving of the Spirit. And so when John's writing this gospel, Jesus has already been crucified. He's already been risen. The Spirit has already been poured out. He's been glorified. He's ascended into heaven. And therefore, he says, Jesus is exactly who he says he is. Jesus is exactly who he says he is. So the last question for us is, who do you think he is? I realize I'm speaking to a room full of mostly Christians, probably. And you can just default to saying, well, I think he's the Christ. Do you judge him rightly? Is there any aspect about Jesus that you're failing to believe? Is there any expectations you have on Jesus that you ought not to have? Who is he for you? Maybe you're like the brothers. Maybe you believe in him on one level. You know he did amazing things. You pray for, to him when really big, big things happen in your life. But ultimately, you love Jesus because of what he does for you or what you hope he will do for you. If that's the case, just like the brothers, you have to repent and judge him rightly. He does have the power to help you. He has the power to help you in every situation. But he's not the Messiah because he salvages your 401k. He's the Messiah because he died on the cross and rose again. And that's where the power will really show up in your life. Power is not, don't ask him to show his power only in the small things like rescuing you financially. He showed his power by saving your soul and by renewing you with the Holy Spirit. If you're like the crowds, maybe you have expectations on him that you shouldn't have. Maybe you expect him to do things in a different way. Maybe your temptation is to not believe that he has the qualifications to be the Messiah. If that's the case, you've misjudged him. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. John 1 says he's the Word. He was in the beginning with God. He is, in fact, God. Through him all things were made. Without him was not anything made that was made. Colossians says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Revelation says he is one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head are white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet are like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice is like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he holds seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face is like the sun shining in full strength. Who is this Jesus? He's the one who's coming again to judge the living and the dead. He's the one who's coming to separate the wheat from the chaff. He's the one who's coming to bring his people home to be with him on the day of glory. And on that day, his identity will never be masked. All will see him on that day as the victorious Lord over all. Judge him rightly today and know him as this awesome Lord and Messiah and Savior and know his grace. That's what the Bible is all about. We see the big story of the Bible summarized in small stories throughout. Jesus is the Christ. So who do you say he is? And I mean you to ask this question. Who do you say he is? If you don't believe, if you haven't been believing in Christ, why not? Who do you say he is? You know what? You're saying something. You're answering it somehow. You're just not answering it the way that he claims to be. And so let me encourage you to change your view of who Jesus is and make who he says he is your view. There's one other group that's in this passage that's not been mentioned yet, and that's the group that believes. There are some in this group who believe. Not every one of the crowds rejects Jesus. It says that some, in verse 31, many of the people believed in him. That's what it looks like to judge him rightly. It looks to believe in him. So if you're believing in him, if you're walking by faith in Christ, if for you Jesus is the living water who you're thirsty for, then you've judged him rightly. And let me encourage you by saying, well done. 
We know that only comes from God, but well done. You need to be encouraged that you're judging him rightly. Let me say this. Keep judging him rightly. Judge him rightly tonight. Judge him rightly tomorrow. Judge him rightly when conflict comes. Judge him rightly when trial comes. Judge him rightly when you need him. Because in judging him rightly, you will receive his grace. Whole point of this chapter, the point of John 6, the point of John 7, is that Jesus is the feast. He is the bread of life. He is the living water. Are you feasting on him? Are you judging him rightly? Let's pray. God, as we look at your word and we see the confusion that surrounds Jesus, I pray you would help us to not be confused. God, if there's anyone in this room who's not believing on you tonight, I pray that you would change their hearts. You would do a work in their souls by the Spirit to see Christ as lifted up as the highest and the greatest, as the Lord overall, as the Messiah, as the feast. I pray, God, you'd help them to see that their life makes no sense apart from Christ. And for us who have believed maybe for many years, God, persevere us until the end. Only those who die believing that you are the feast will receive eternal life. But you promised to persevere us until the end. And so we ask you, God, help us to continue to judge you rightly so that we don't dishonor your name and so we can make it to the day where we celebrate the feast with you forever in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.